Welcome, Dr. Stephen Lyman. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Happy to be on. Um, I, uh, we, we were talking just before the show and I realized, oh, we, we better record. You're so much fun to talk to. I got to get this on the air. <laughs> so uh, why don't we start, why don't you tell uh, the audience a little bit about your background and how you came to be where you are. Okay. Uh, so I, um, I'm American. I was born in Buffalo, New York. I uh, grew up in Tampa, Florida and uh, earned a PhD in epidemiology uh, from the University of Alabama, Birmingham. And then I was based in New York City for 16 years doing uh, orthopedic outcomes research, which you wonder why an epidemiologist would be doing that. Uh, but you can use the methods that you learn in how to research health problems, and you can apply it to almost any health condition. And so I studied uh, orthopedics, especially sports medicine and uh, arthritis, which I still do. Although in 2018, I took a sabbatical to Japan, uh, and I am actually, I've, I haven't come back. So I worked out a deal where I'm working remotely for a hospital in New York City while also uh, teaching at a medical school here um, in Fukuoka, which is the largest city in Kyushu, which is the largest of the, the southernmost of the four largest islands in Japan. Uh, and it's, it's, I guess, climate-wise, it's pretty close to probably South Carolina, Georgia. It's pretty hot and humid in the summer with mild winters. And I'm really enjoying life here. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't tell from your, your accent. The, the South Carolina, a lot of ways, but South Carolina, Japan. Um, so, uh, yeah, I don't know where we want to go first. I guess let's, let's talk about what's on everybody's mind, uh, the virus and kind of what, what your take on it. Um, I had, I had read your LinkedIn article about what to do, how to, how to best survive this. You, you want to go over those points for, uh, our, sure, readers, sure. our listeners? Yeah, I think, um, I would say, first of all, it's, it really comes down to, I would, I don't, whether you want to call it hygiene or. Sorry, I'm just calling up the article here. Whether you want to call it hygiene or um, or sanitation, it's it very much about maintaining cleanliness uh, to keep the virus from spreading. And it's really, it seems like what we know at this point is most of the transmission is is through touching rather than through uh, the virus in the air. Uh, which is actually a good thing because it's much easier to control something that's spread by touching than something that's spread through the air. So uh, there is there is a, a risk of air spread if you're. It seems like it really requires that you be in a in a room in close contact with somebody who's infected, in order for for you to get to catch it to be likely to catch it through the air. Um, but uh, the virus does live on surfaces for much longer. Uh, then it'll stay in the air. And that's why touching, it becomes such a, a key part of this where, you know, what I've taken to is any time I go outside, I have alcohol sanitizer with me. And if I touch any surfaces outside of my home with my hands, I'll sanitize them with alcohol and then I'll wash them as soon as I get home. And uh, the other thing is any if you just think about how many things we touch when we go out, right? Even when you're shopping, you're pick, taking things off the shelf and putting them in your cart and that sort of thing. Somebody else has touched those potentially within the last three days or so, which is about how long we believe that it can survive potentially on surfaces. Um, that's, that's an, it's unlikely to survive that long, but it's not out of the realm of possibility. So whenever I go shopping, I bring everything home and I wash them. I, either wipe them down with alcohol wipes or I actually wash the items with soap and water uh, once they're in my house and then I sanitize everything I can. Now this is an overabundance of caution because we do not yet have uh, a community spread in Fukuoka, but the virus is here, we do have cases. So, so, so let, let me just ask you about that, like a practical matter. Okay. So let's say you go, you go shopping and you, you buy meat, you buy poultry, you buy vegetables, you buy a box of pasta. I mean, I don't eat pasta, but I know a lot of people do. You, you might buy cans of things. So do you, you actually watch, wash each individual item? I do. Uh, well, you have a couple of options, right? One thing is if you don't need the things right away, you could just leave them 
for a few days for there, be, there to be time for the virus to, to die out. Or if you're going to be using them sooner, then you should probably wash them because you're never going to be able, it's, I think it's best to get into the habit of washing them as you're bringing them into your house because you're not going to remember what you washed and what you didn't if you if you wait to do it later unless you're keeping them in a specific box or a specific bag right. to know these are the the ones that haven't been cleaned and these are the ones that have now there's some things you can't practically wash and those things you just have to you know kind of deal with now it does seem like uh, cardboard paper things like that the virus doesn't live as long so i'm a little bit less worried about transmission from like a delivery person if they're handing me a cardboard box or something like that than I am, or the mailman, right? A little less concerned than I am with uh, a hard surface item. But even the, with delivery, you have to remember that somebody else probably put all those things into the package. It probably wasn't the delivery guy. So you're in contact with at least two other people when you do that. Right. So um, you know, this might all sound paranoid, especially for people that are in areas where there isn't community spread yet. But I think these are good habits to get into for when there is community spread. And it's easier to establish those habits when we have lower stress. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you two things at once. It sounds psychotic and I'm doing <laughs> it. And the second thing is I'm doing it. So, um, yeah, I mean, I kind of think I'm crazy when I'm doing it. Well, my, before, before I read your article, um, I had, my, my brother had sent me your article. I, I didn't put two and two together when we first started talking. But I read your article and others like it. and. Uh, my girlfriend comes from a place where people are, are pretty uh, stringent about that kind of thing anyway. So as soon as I was coming home, she's like, you know, uh, yeah, okay, give, give me all, don't touch anything, don't get in here. She would bring it in and she would, uh, we went through, um, what is it, Lysol at an incredible rate. She would just Lysol everything in sight. And I'm like, don't put it on the, you know, don't put it on the app. She, you know, put it on anything, then washed it. And then, you know, it's just like, which, and then after I read your article, uh, I stopped being such a jerk about it. I'm like, okay, well, you're, you're probably right to, to take it to that level. Um, but what I'm realizing, I mean, one of the things that's frustrating from my perspective is um, there are some healthcare professionals who are more telling you what to do rather than why. Like I understand, like, for example, they, they didn't want you to hoard masks. But from what I understand, like if everyone wore a mask, the mask may not protect you, but if, if, because it, it, the spread starts when, when someone isn't showing symptoms, you might have a hundred people walking around, they're going to a grocery store, they're doing different things. They're walking around, they could infect somebody else. If all 100 people in the stores wear the mask, uh, probably 90 plus of them don't need to wear the mask, but because we don't know who it is, everyone wears it and then it, it helps stop the spread. So um, kind of explaining that would, I find is more effective for people so they can understand there's no need to hoard the, I mean, we, we want our doctors and nurses and, and, and people that really need it to have them first. And then once they have them, we really do want people to wearing them. But the other thing I hadn't heard about as much, and, and from listening to you, I think there should be more of an emphasis, is having people wear gloves. So when I go out and I go shopping or I go out for a walk, I put on a pair of gloves. And so I don't really have to worry too much about what it is I touch. As soon as I come in, I, I ditch the gloves and I wash my hands. So that, you know, at least until we've got a vaccine, that seems like a good practice for people to take on, no? Yeah, so I'm not wearing gloves currently, but that's because I'm in a community without community spread, right? We don't have un unidentified cases, and Japan's done an excellent job with what's called contact tracing, which is once somebody's identified and diagnosed, they find everyone that they were in touch with from the time they started to show symptoms. Somebody might slip through the cracks if they were asymptomatic was before they were showing symptoms, but they were already shedding virus. But uh, so far, Japan seems to have done a very nice job with contact tracing, and they're getting everyone to self-isolate who was exposed, even if they aren't testing them until they're showing some symptoms. That's one of the criticisms of Japan has been that they're not testing enough. But I think because their public health system has been so effective at contact tracing, they've been able to manage this without testing everyone. Uh, although Korea tested everyone or anybody who wanted to be tested and they got a handle on this faster than anybody, which, you know, was to their credit. Japan is taking a different approach, but it's too soon to know whether or not that approach is going to work long term. But so I'm not wearing gloves here. That was a long way of saying I'm not wearing gloves here, but I do have gloves. And if community spread starts here, I will definitely do what you're doing. Um, and then as far as wearing a mask, 
I started wearing a mask in mid January, whenever I left my apartment here, because that was when the first case arrived in Japan. Uh, it was around January 16th, I believe. And I, and what it was for me is what the mask does for me is it teaches me not to touch my face. We're, we're unconscious face touchers, right? We're always scratch. I just scratched my forehead and I was aware of it. Um, but we touch our face all the time. And if you touch your eyes or you touch your nose, you touch your mouth while you have virus on your hands, you have a very high chance of getting infected. Wearing a mask covers two of those three things, right? If you're wearing the mask properly, it's covering your nose and your mouth. Um, and so I wear a mask now when I go out in public, if I'm going to go indoors, I'll wear a mask. If I'm gonna go out for a bike ride or go out for a walk in the park, I, I, I may have a mask with me, but I'm not going to put it on uh, because the virus does not stay in the air long at all when you've got a breeze and all the elements that we have going on outdoors. And also Japanese people, because we've been living with this now for, uh, what is it, April. So we've been dealing with this for two and a half months in Japan. Uh, people are, are socially distancing. A Japanese naturally socially distance. But I'm noticing that people are are walking further apart on the sidewalk. They're standing further apart when they're waiting for a cross light. They're standing a little further apart when they're waiting in line at stores. So uh, the Japanese seem to have adapted to a new lifestyle that allows for that social distancing, even in a crowded urban environment. Um, do Japanese so that's shake why hands I'm, or do they bow? Japanese do not shake hands. Actually, when you were talking earlier, I, um, I would actually say the shorthand of, of how we should be changing our behavior as Americans or as people in the Western world is be Japanese, be more Japanese. Uh, Japanese people do not shake hands. Uh, unless you're a foreigner, then they might want to shake your hand because they're trying to be polite. But they'll completely understand now is not the time to start shaking hands. Um, Japanese, ha J Japan has a mass culture during flu season. Uh, 60, 70, 80% of people on the subway will be wearing masks on their commute because they don't want to catch the flu and they don't want to spread it if they have it. Um, and then uh, another another good habit to get into if you don't know already is take off your shoes when you get home. You don't know where the, what you've tracked through as you've been walking around. I'm not really so even so much worried about viral spread, but like dog feces and urine and all sorts of things can end up you know, trace amounts of it on your shoes. And why would you want that in your carpet and on your, on your floors? Yeah. So, and then uh, the other, the other habit that Japanese people all have is when you get home, you wash your hands, you know, outside is considered unsanitary, right? So that's why you take off your shoes and then you wash your hands. Um, the other thing that I would suggest to people is if you are in a community with community spread is that you change your clothes when you get home and put them in the laundry. Don't, don't rewear them, you know. I, I wear this tracksuit several days a week now that we're in work from home mode, but I don't wear it out, right? So I can rewear it a couple times before I need to wash it. Um, so it's not enough but, if, you, like, if you like if you got if you wear a coat outside. That's not enough. You 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 should change out every layer. I, I would. So that's a good point. If you're wearing a coat and you've got it zipped up, what's underneath the coat's going to be fine. Although as you take off your coat, if there's virus on your coat and then you use their hands before you wash them to unzip or unbutton other things, you know, we don't know. But, uh, but like I said, softer materials, the virus doesn't seem to live as long. So fabrics and, and paper products, I think, are a little bit less risky. But, you know, you still have your trousers. You still have, you know, other things that you are wearing that you may want to just go ahead and wash again. Or, or what you can do is you can designate a closet in your house and that's where you hang things that you've worn recently yeah and then you know wait a few days and then you can you can use them again right but you just got to give the virus time to die yeah and that's complicated if you've got a small it house is. or a small apartment there's just sure. and then and the other complication is if you don't have laundry in your apartment uh mm -hmm. that's, those are difficult things you can't you can't necessarily if you've got if you've got laundry and you can just throw it in the laundry throw it in the you know and then 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 run it yourself that's no problem but mm -hmm. It's a whole, right, right. Um, it's a whole different thing. So th what, what's interesting is before, you know, I'm, I'm in Long Beach, California. And when, um, before the social, what you, uh, what's a nice way of saying lockdown, quarantine started, stay at home, 
started. Yeah. Uh, when I would see my friends, I would start doing the uh, Vulcan salute. And uh, it's my, my version of being Japanese. I, I predict that we're going to have some version of that. That I, I can't see Americans bowing to each other, but I could see us doing the Vulcan salute or, you know, something of that nature. Um, That's right. When, when I, I gave a talk at Japan Society in New York last, uh, last month, just actually two days before the emergency declaration was made by the mayor. Uh, and I, I had taught everybody how to bow. Um, but I agree with you. I don't think that bowing is going to become part of American int introductions. So, but the vote Vulcan salutes, uh, clever. I like that. Yeah. I, so. I, I was just kind of doing this whenever, or just one hand, you know, as mine, I didn't get, I didn't geek out into the yeah. Star Trek. I see some of them that just go like this, you know, like that, like my heart mm -hmm. to your mm -hmm. heart. I, I don't know yep. what's going to yep. happen, but. I can see sure. something's going to popularize it. I bet you when it goes on some music video, that's that'll be the thing. You know, the rappers will do that or mm -hmm. whatever it is. Right, right. Um, but, yeah, somebody will figure it out. Well, you know, what is it I'd, I'd heard? I don't know if it's apocryphal. The handshake started uh, because, you know, swordsmen would pass each other and it's like I'm, I'm taking my sword hand and I'm shaking it so that, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to kill you. It's kind of like a that's right. peace kind of thing. So that's how that started. So. You know, maybe this I've heard the same thing, actually. Yeah. So uh, the traditions that we think we've always been doing it, the cavemen didn't do that. They did something else. Mm -hmm. So right. uh, traditions have to start from somewhere. So that's mm -hmm. that's pretty interesting. So so do you must get beyond other podcast requests to all your friends call you to say what's going on? What's happening? What's it like? being? I get I, I do get a lot of text messages and emails and messages on different social media platforms for with questions. Uh, a few of my friends in New York, actually, they've made it part of their routine to just call me once a week to catch up. Uh, I was actually in New York. Uh, as I mentioned, I gave a talk at Japan Society. So I left Fukuoka after the first cases were here. We had two cases when I left in Fukuoka. I went to New York, went to a conference in Florida, went back to New York, gave a talk at Japan Society. And and then I, so I was in New York when the when the exponential spread and the community spread started and ended up changing my flight back to to get home to to Japan. I would rather um, I had a feeling that the, the healthcare system in New York was going to get hammered, which is what's happening now. And I had a feeling that in Japan, while their health system may end up getting hammered, they do seem to have slowed. They, they're keeping that curve underneath the the critical threshold and so i felt like it might be better managed here and i also um my apartment here is much more comfortable than than new york and also my wife was starting a new job on april 1st actually yesterday and you know if we had gotten stuck in new york uh you know she would have missed her first day of work which wouldn't have been good yeah, so, so we decided for all those reasons levels yeah. yeah i mean but but by the day we left it was there were 600 cases in new york now, obviously, there's, what is it? It's an unbelievable number in New York State. Yeah. And um, yeah, there's a I, lot of people. I, I looked at it this morning. But... Sorry. Wish I, sometimes I wish my laptop wasn't password protected. Yeah, it's two, this has 215,000 cases in the U.S., 245,000 cases in the U.S., 93,000 in New York. There were 600 when I left on... Uh, basically two weeks ago that's to go from nice, 600 nice to 93,000. Right? Yeah, that's right. Yep. Yeah. And yeah. New York is actually, they seem to be close that's to awesome. flattening the number, the number of new cases, yep. uh, which is great news for New York, but they're so strained right now. You know, I think the city is actually going to recover faster than most of the other parts simply because of the strict rules that are put into place. But now it looks like Buffalo is getting hit. Uh, and then, you know, we've got other large cities in New York. So that state is under a pretty extreme pressure right now. Yeah. Well, I wonder, so uh, being hit hard, do they recover faster? They, you know, as hard as it is. So the scary part for me is that the health, the healthcare system getting overwhelmed is what really makes this go from bad to worse. Uh, in Italy, I don't know about the data from Italy, but in China, the death rate from coronavirus, from COVID-19, before their health 
healthcare system was overwhelmed was about 4%, which is still very high for something like this. The flu is about 0 0.1 to 0.4%, depending on how virulent it is. So 10 to 40 times more deadly than the flu. And, but that was their death rate before the system got overwhelmed. Once it got over, overwhelmed, it was 12%. So they it three three times more likely to die in an overwhelmed healthcare system than in a, a well-functioning one. And that's where my worry lies, is that the mortality uh, potential for what's happening in the States right now could really get out of hand. Well, yeah, I mean, it, and, and not just from the virus. I mean, I think people are avoiding hospitals anyway. So if, uh, I mean, if you're giving birth, you're, you're giving birth. But uh, if you've got some more, some sort of problem, you're just less likely to. You're gonna you're gonna bother your doctor with it, you know. Mm -hmm. And might be might be potentially very dangerous. But um, you're just gonna, I'll I'll tough it out, right? I, I think right. It's just it's just bad having the the healthcare system overwhelmed mm -hmm. altogether. Agreed. Agreed. But I wonder. So you know, we have a mutual friend who's recovering from it, and. Um, I have a bunch of other friends in New York. One of them I talked to uh, said that yeah, he's, he's starting to feel a lot better. He's going to donate blood and he wants to go, go out and get back to work. So, you know, I wonder, is it if, if let's say, what did you say? 200 and 215 or a thousand people have it in, in New York right now? No, no, no. It's uh, 93,000 in New York, 245,000 in the U S. Okay. So, so 90, 93,000 cases. Yeah. So that's, so let's say that, you know, 90,000 of them recover. I'm just using gross numbers. Mm -hmm. Is there, is there any reason to, for those people to stay at home? Uh, I would say no. Once you've recovered, once your symptoms have resolved, I think you, you may still have the virus in your system, but your body's fighting it, but it's not fighting it so strongly that it's actually, you know, you, you're not feeling the immune response. Um, I probably shouldn't even start talking about immunology because I'm not an immunologist, but um, the what you should do is you should continue to use these precautions that we described, partly because if you if you still have virus present, you may still be able to spread it, although it's it's a very low likelihood of transmission, it's still possible. So continue to wash your hands, continue not to touch people, continue to wear a mask if you have one. Um, but get back to work. We need we need people to get back to work. We need people who are now immune to you know get out there and keep things moving you know there are vital services that need to be performed there are probably opportunities to volunteer uh, i know that mount sinai in new york uh, methodist hospital in houston and I, i'm sure there's one out in la that's doing the the plasma uh, uh, research to see whether or not that's an effective method to use the antibodies and people have recovered to help the sick fight fight this which is probably one of our more uh, uh, optimistic treatment options right now because we're so new in understanding this disease. Well, wh where I'm asking the questions from is I'm trying to figure out what it's going to look like emerging from this. Like, you know, if, if you have a significant percentage of the population that can go back to work, can you start to open what is quote unquote non-essential businesses if they're being staffed by people that, you know, that are functionally immune, assuming they still wear masks and gloves and everything else. Uh, if you've got a clothing shop, uh, shouldn't you be able to open that up? Now, I know, you know, part of the reason you want to close the shops is not to encourage people to go out when you don't need to. But mm -hmm. you know, I'm just trying to think like, what is, I don't think we're going to go for, and maybe, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't see that we're going to go uh, from, you know, stay at home to, okay, everybody can run around now. It'll be a gradual process, right? So as you've got people I, immune, how do you how do you how do you turn the spigot back on is what I'm asking. Right. I think probably, I mean, hopefully we all have learned from this and we'll start practicing these personal precautions. Right. And then, you know, the, the aspect we haven't talked too much about is the social distancing aspect of it. Right. We're basically keeping yourself apart from other people who you don't know whether or not they're infected. Once you're in a community with community spread, you should assume everyone you meet is infected whether they're showing symptoms or not. That should just be the, oops. that should be, I'm going to have to turn my camera. I'm sorry, I realized my battery is running out on my iPad here. Just a second. No worries. It's uh, these little doesn't, real touches. Doesn't make for that great. Make it, that, that make yeah. it exciting. Doesn't make for great uh, television, I guess. All right, so we'll turn it that way. 
a little bit and get it away from me. All right. So, um, sorry, I think, you know, we're not going to go back to, I don't think in the near term, until this is, is essentially, until we've stopped the community spread and we're back to being able to do contact tracing and this becomes a rare disease again, um, or we have a vaccine. I, I don't think we're going to go back to filled stadiums and and stadium concerts and things like that. I think we're going to need to adapt to a new reality for how we consume that kind of entertainment um, in the near term. You know, what they've done in Japan is they haven't, uh, for sumo, for example, they haven't canceled the sumo tournaments, but they're playing, they're, they're wrestling in empty stadiums. Right. So all you have is, is the sumo wrestlers, the camera operators, <laughs> the referee. Right. And it's weird because you're used to the, the sound of the crowd during a, a good match, but you know, it's, it's safer than having everybody sitting next to each other and potentially spreading the disease. Now team sports like baseball and soccer and football, I think are harder to, and basketball obviously was already spread in the NBA, um, is more difficult because players come into contact with one another more but, than just the sumo wrestlers. The sumo wrestlers were being evaluated for symptoms before they were allowed to compete. Well, you know, um, first of all, there's enough money in some of it. And secondly, once the testing is not so scarce, you could mm -hmm. conceivably test them before every game mm -hmm. and go, okay, you're not allowed on the football field unless you're clean right now. Right. Forget about mm -hmm. your symptoms. And then like right, right now we wouldn't waste that many tests, but yeah. you know, presumably when you, you've got enough of them, that's not a problem. And mm -hmm. uh, certainly for football, uh, most of the revenue is from TV and not from the, uh, it'd be weird to have NC stadiums, but just like you got my background, uh, you know, they could do the virtual backgrounds, right? Sure, sure. Oh, or, or whatever they need to do that would, you know, I mean, the, the, the crowds is the least of the issues. I think mm -hmm. getting back mm -hmm. to normal, if, if it's safe for the players to play, mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. I for one would love to see sports back. Uh, sure. I, I, there's plenty of things on Netflix, but, you know, it helps make things back to normal and being able to see yeah. it on TV would make a difference. But what you're saying is, uh, if these things start up, we shouldn't expect players in the stands unless we, 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 we've got a vaccine, which that's not going to happen in two months, right? Yeah, I think uh, vaccine is probably looking at, uh, I just heard yesterday that the sort of best case scenario, at least for one of the companies that's developing it, would be uh, early next year. Right. So we're still looking at you know about 10 months away, even with fast tracking. Now, one of the other companies might be faster. I know that the Chinese have already started. Uh, I think they've started animal testing. I don't think they've done. They haven't gotten to humans yet, or maybe they've gotten to humans and have. Uh, they've finished animals and are now going to humans. I don't remember, but it's still going to take a while to get a vaccine, and then you have to ramp up production of that vaccine uh, once all the testing is done to demonstrate that it works. So. Yeah. So we're talking best case scenario a year and, and possibly 18 months or even longer, right? Till That's right. Yeah. And, but I think, you know, for example, you know, the other thing you, you could do is you could allow limited fan attendance as long as there's the opportunity to distance. Right. Right. So you sell every third seat yeah. and people have to sit apart unless they're in families. You know, if they, if their people already live together, you're not going to make them sit separately, but um, that's not going to be great, but it's something, right? It helps some semblance of normalcy return, you know, right. maybe for concerts, it's smaller venues, right? Because a lot of it is, is um, just, I guess, for example, and, you know, this is speaking as an epidemiologist and understanding how these diseases spread. When I was, at, I was out in New York on the night or the, I went out the evening that the mayor declared the emergency and I was out with friends. We went out for drinks and we specifically chose small bars because that limits the number of people you're exposed to, right? So in one bar, there was probably 15 other customers. In another bar, there was probably 25, right? We, we didn't go to big places where there was lots of people. Um, and that, that helps reduce your risk because it's about uh, probability. And so if you imagine that at that time, I believe on the day that he announced there were around two, 200 cases in New York City, and the estimates were that 
because in communities where testing was not being done, where there was evidence of cases that the actual number of cases is probably between, between 10 and 100 times more than the number reported. So that meant when there were 200 cases in New York, there were between 2,000 and 20,000 cases in New York. So doing the math, if you, if you're going to meet 50 other people in a city of 8 million, the probability is 50 over 8 million, or sorry, 20,000 over 8 million. So a basketball right. game, so, you had a good chance you're in the same building as somebody. That's right. Who has it. Um, that's right. What's the difference between a, you know, like a football stadium that's open air versus an indoor football stadium or an indoor basketball? That's, that's an excellent question. And I would think that the smaller arenas would, you'd have more chance of, of infection for, based on the air quality. That, but I don't know what the circulation, air circulation requirements are for that. When I was flying back, I was quite nervous about getting on an airplane, going through airports, you know, I can from, imagine. from New York going back to Japan. But then I, I read about the modern circulation systems on, on commercial aircraft. The air is being recycled every three minutes. Yeah. So unless you're sitting directly next to somebody who's infected and they're touching the same armrest as you, there's very, very low chance of spread through an airplane, at least for, from a distance, right? Now, there have been cases where it seems like people have caught it on airplanes, uh, but it probably involved closer contact, not washing your hands after touching surfaces that you don't know who else touched them, that sort of thing. Well, the bathrooms, too, are very, like, cleaning your hands in an airport bathroom is not so easy, and it doesn't, like, you know, like, now I haven't, have, I haven't, gone flying since this the thing was announced i'm just trying to imagine what it's like trying not to touch any of the surfaces like the sink and then mm -hmm. finish washing your hands and then completely clean and don't touch any surfaces that that, yep. that seems like a non-trivial exercise so, yeah so the idea in my mind and this what this is how i did it just kind of maybe this is really getting into the weeds but assume as soon as you're getting out of your seat so first of all i had alcohol wipes and i i sanitized my seating area right, right? when I got on the plane. So then I could assume that that area is clean. Then I, um, when I went to the bathroom, that was, I had violated my safety zone, right? I had, I'd gone out in public. So I, obviously you have to open the door to the bathroom. You go into the bathroom, do your business, whatever you're in the bathroom for. And then as, once you're washing, you, you, you're washing your hands, before you finish washing your hands, open the door a crack. So you can just push it open with your foot. Right. So you've touched the door handle again, but now you can finish washing your hands. Or the other option is you take those towels that you use to dry your hands and you use that to open the door and then throw them. I away. do that anyway. I mean, yeah. I, don't, I don't know what it was, but uh, for years, I don't open a, ba a bathroom door. I try not mm -hmm. to touch any of those services. I don't I, just generally when I'm out, maybe, you know, that's a good psychotic thing that I did. I don't grab <laughs> handles with my hands. Worst, I try and open it with my feet if I can. And mm -hmm. worst case scenario, I'll open it with my pinky. Because on the off okay. chance that I don't wash my hands, I won't yep. I'll less likely touch my pinky to my, you know. So uh, mm -hmm. those are probably good habits that maybe they're yeah. saving me. I don't know. But yeah, the other thing is I had hand sanitizer, little little sanitizer gel, and so whenever the stewardesses would hand me my drinks or my food or whatever, um, you know, I'd pure all my hands as I was, you know, getting ready to have my meal or whatever, because then it should. Oh, you know, reduce risk of infection. unfortunately. So, you know, I have a Jewish mother and unfortunately uh, she has dementia or otherwise she'd be gloating like nobody's business. You see, I told you, I told you. <laughs> this. Yeah. I can imagine. <laughs> With all the wives and what have you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, I, you know, part of where I'm, 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 what I'm trying to understand, I, I'm assuming that if, if I'm curious about it, the average viewer, uh, in the audience would be would be interested in this. Like, what is it going to look like looking like to normal? So what I'm getting is mm -hmm. concerts or situations where we're all together. I, I'm sure someone will figure out the airflow, which they, you know, is Staples Center have good enough air purification? And if they mm -hmm. want to start games, what, what equipment do they have to put in to make the spread less and, and all these various things. But mm -hmm. um, the, the other yeah, problem, course, go ahead. Sorry, as I was saying, I don't, I don't know that it's really going to be so much about air contagion, airborne contagion. It's, it's more about surfaces. 
but it's so hard for you to create a safe space in a stadium when you've got 20,000 people in there, right? For each individual, each person there needs to feel, and, and, and all of the touching that happens at the, at the, uh, you know, the, the food stands, the beer cart, the, the bathrooms, the ticket turnstiles, there's just all these different opportunities for, for contact with other people. And, but I think once community spread is, is, it won't, it probably won't be eradicated, but I think if it gets low enough that the, the risk is low enough, that's where, it, that's when it becomes acceptable, right? So I do think what's going to come back to normal earlier is going to be businesses reopening, you know, and maybe there's going to be protocols that are recommended for only so many people in the store at a time. Maybe they're, what they've done now, I think, in, I, thought, I saw a picture in China where they've, they put markings on the floor for how far away you should LA. stand when you're in line. Okay. We have that in LA. If you want to get into yep. the local Vons, uh, if there's too many people in the store, the guard will stop you. And there's on the entrance, there's little, you know, red markings about how, how far away, you know, how many people can be in line and what order. And then hmm. same thing for every checkout line. We have the, okay. the markings. So I, okay. I'm assuming well, that, that's I, everywhere. I think that that's, that's useful. That's helpful. Now, the thing that I've seen here in Japan, they don't have that sort of system in place right now because we don't have community spread, is um, uh, a lot of the shops now have hand sanitizer, alcohol sanitizer right on a, in a pump jar right at the front door. So as you walk in, you, you sanitize your hands. My, and my everybody's seven, wearing masks. My 7-Eleven has that. You get in 7-Eleven, it's yeah. a couple blocks away, open up, boom, get in and sanitize your hands, which is great. Um, but uh, masks here are pretty scarce. Haven't been able to I'm buy sure. masks. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm it, also... Let, let, okay. Let's talk about that for a minute then because there are there are home, homemade alternatives. Oh, that's what the I was actually... The real reason... Go ahead. As I was, yeah, the real reason that I think it is important to wear a mask, you don't need an N95 mask unless you're treating people with active disease, right? Unless you're a frontline responder, you do not need an N95 mask. But where now you could make a case for like Amazon delivery people probably should have them. Uh, subway car operators and bus drivers should probably have them, right? People who are going to be exposed to a lot of people in an active epidemic environment should probably have them. But individual citizens probably don't need them. It's probably overkill. Yeah. Um, and if you can't get commercial grade masks, which in Japan, they're actually scarce now, but because everybody went and bought them. And actually what happened is a lot of Chinese flew to Japan, bought all the masks they could find and flew back to China. So um, what, 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 what I was gonna recommend is you can, really what you're trying to do, remember I mentioned earlier, is not touch your face. You're trying to teach yourself not to touch your face. And that's something that a mask is very useful for. And also the mechanism, I understand an N95. Can I just touch your forehead. Yeah. yeah, there you go. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> the, the N95 mask is designed as a micron filter, right? It can, it can catch any bacteria or, or uh, virus that can pass through the, through the, the, or that would pass through a normal mask, right? But it's not, the airborne transmission is, is relatively remote. And so just having some sort of barrier, something in front of your face, uh, there's a possibility that the virus would land on that instead of passing through. So uh -huh. even a even a bandana, even something that you make at home, so for show it's gonna and be tell, better than nothing. For show and tell, let me tell you that you're gonna think I'm psychotic, but hang on one second, I'll show you. Sure. So besides so besides the um, the uh, gloves. So when I go out, I've got my glasses, which okay. main function is not to touch my eyes. Then I've got yeah. this gator that I put on. Actually, I'm going to take off my glasses to do that. Yeah. So pull this on, go like this. Mm -hmm. And, and then uh, something that I would do is I would take a coffee filter, <laughs> the extra thing. So you got the whole thing going. Then when I'm done, yeah. I threw out the coffee filter. I, yeah. I ordered a bunch of these. So this would go in the, uh, in the laundry. 
Okay. And I wipe down the glasses with, you know, alcohol and what have you. Is that overkill? Yeah. You probably I think that that's reason. <laughs> if, you, if you're in a community with community spread, I'd say that that's reasonable, that that's reasonable precautions. I'd say if you're not, then that's overkill. Yeah. But on the other hand, you are, um, you know, we're trying to get into good habits. That's what I think people need to understand is, you know, all of these things may seem like overkill or psychotic or however you want to call it. We're trying to establish good habits because if you reduce your risk of transmission to yourself, you're also reducing the risk that you're going to pass it on to anybody else. And that's what we, if enough of us do that, then we can get ahead of this thing and, and bend the curve, so to speak. I, I know the coffee filter thing. That, that's the thing I felt kind of self-conscious about. But the truth of the matter is, if I have it and don't know it, so this is, you know, the extra layer that's stopping the, the other thing, you know, it's just like, okay. And, and mm -hmm. maybe I'm just, you know, maybe it's overkill, but it makes me feel better, right? So I've got the, yep. yeah. But the funny thing is, I'm not the only one that goes like that. You see, plenty, you think it's a scene out of uh, Mad Max or what have you. Yeah. And I'm just walking down today. I was walking down. I'm like this. Someone else. I've got, you know, so this woman with a mask. Somebody else with, you know, their yeah. ski, their ski goggles and the whole thing. And sure. it's just another day in L.A. But yeah, you know. I, I, that's very funny. I, I saw a picture. I don't know if it was real or not, but it, there was a woman standing in line apparently with a, a snorkel, masking, but she had she was using the. Yeah, you know, the snorkel for for breathing, <laughs> well, I, and that I, doesn't seem effective to me. <laughs> well, I would. I actually thought about doing that. I I swim, so I have a snorkel, but then yeah. I'm like, well, wherever the hole is, you still would need to put something like this to cover the hole and what have you. Yep. Uh, yeah. But, but I'm sure you saw that there there's some people in Italy who are taking the scuba masks, mm. uh, and attaching ventilators to them, or you know, doing some makeshift ventilators. So okay, I haven't seen that, but. Yeah. One, one prediction I have is uh, I'm going to guess six months to nine months from now for people that, that have money to burn, you know, $250, you'll have some sort of high end mask that's, mm -hmm. you know, maybe has reusable filters in them or, or not reusable or some, some sort of method that gives you better than N95 or more importantly is more mm -hmm. durable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you may be right. What I think, what I do my wife and I were lucky. We sort of had masks already. This is well before this epidemic started. We had a pack of 50 masks that my wife had picked up at some point. And then uh, occasionally when I've been traveling in Japan, I'll, I'll get a little bit of a cold or something and I'll, I'll go into a convenience store and buy a pack. And then I use one mask and then by the time, you know, I get home and I don't need the rest. So we sort of stockpiled naturally. Your strategic reserve. That's right. Um, but th what my wife taught me is how to wash them these aren't single use necessarily, you know, the, the quality of fabric may degrade over time, but with some gentle soap and water washing and then hang dry, you know, I, so what I do is I cycle two masks. Every time I come home, I wash the one that I just wore, hang it up to dry. And by the time I'm ready to go out again, the, the one from the day before was dry. Oh, perfect. And so, yeah. And then I, we do have more masks, but we haven't actually had to crack into them since we got home because we've just been washing the ones that we've been using. That's really awesome. So, yeah, I mean that's uh, those are all good things. When when I can find a mask again, I'll I'll do that. I'll uh, rotate them. But um, yeah, what I'm really getting from this is the gloves is the more important piece. Than, yeah, uh, I, I think so. I think gloves make a lot of sense. I well, I, my wife asked. I asked her to buy some gloves when we got back, and so she went online and she's like, "You think one box is enough?" And I said, "Well, we don't know how long this is going to last. Might want to get a little bit more than that. It's one box is a hundred gloves, so fifty pairs." couple of days later the doorbell rings and the delivery comes and she'd ordered 500 pairs of gloves so we we've, we've got more more disposable gloves than i ever thought we'd own yeah well that sounds yeah that sounds well that's that's how the toilet paper disappears right everyone wants just a little extra do you have yeah. toilet paper in japan oh toilet paper is not a problem but the way that they got over that panic was because uh, that that it happened in japan before it happened in the states where all the toilet paper disappeared and you know, and, and politicians or people come on come on the air and say, there is not a shortage of toilet paper. We have plenty of toilet paper. Don't panic buy. And everybody's like, they're lying to us, right? Nobody believed it because they'd go to five different stores and there was no toilet paper, right? Because there was this social panic, right? Everybody's worried that they didn't have toilet paper until a um, what one of the toilet paper manufacturers did was invited 
NHK, which is like the uh, the Japanese version of like the BBC or PBS, into their factory, into their warehouse, and showed that they they had something like 180 million rolls of toilet paper just waiting for shipment. And then, and they're like, we make it right here in Japan. This this wasn't produced in China, right? You 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 will have toilet paper. And so since then, everybody just buys at their normal rate. Well, the interesting thing is, I think where these shortages come from is changes in patterns. So, mm-hmm. like, why why do we run out of food or certain kind of food? Um, in LA, just speaking for the LA culture, there are a lot of people, especially in the upscale neighborhoods, but even in the downscale ones, where eating out, you know, out of assuming you eat two to three meals a day, um, mm-hmm. a huge number of people eat at least one meal out a day. If it's breakfast, mm-hmm. if it's if it's dinner, you know, or now even if you can't afford it, then you go to a cheaper restaurant. If you can't afford it, you go to a a, a nicer one or what have you. But at the end of the day, um, that's that's just part of how people eat. If you're if you're working and you've got a you've got a job, you got to you go for breakfast, you do the drive through, you do that, and that's and so the fact that so many restaurants you could do takeout, but if you're not working, you're not going to drive through the McDonald's or wherever you're getting your breakfast. You're just home now. So instead of eating, you know, eating your, your daily breakfast, now you got to have enough eggs for breakfast. So boom, you know, the, the stocking levels weren't where they needed to be. Mm-hmm. And similarly for so many items, that's why some items were gone. I can't, I don't, I cannot explain toilet paper and I can't explain bottled water either, but you know, I guess it's, it's a fear thing. Sure but right, people right. don't realize how much water they actually drink. And so as much right. water as they buy, if all water is out, those mm-hmm. 12 cases aren't enough for you. You know, that's not right. going to, that's not going to be, but I have a Brita yeah. and, and just use that. So I filter my water. Right. And, uh, so one thing I, that, I, yeah, go ahead. That's, that's what we do as well as the filtration, the water filtered water just at home rather than buying bottled water. Um, the same, I, I agree with you about, the, the shift in patterns and it will take the supply chain time to catch up with that. And w- here in Japan, people have a habit of shopping daily. You buy, f- if you're, if you're a home cook, right? If you tend to eat your meals at home, then you basically go to the store after work every day and buy whatever you're going to cook that night. There isn't this American style, a week's worth of groceries, two weeks worth of groceries. And so we've had to get into the habit of not just buying fresh food, right? We've, so we bought some, some uh you know dried noodles and and packaged things that we you know canned sardines or you know vegetables whatever which we don't normally keep at home but we've had to expand our pantry to include those kinds of things and it was really funny because when i told my wife after we got back we should we should do a big shop we should go to the grocery store and just buy everything we think we'll need and probably buy a couple of weeks worth of like pasta and rice and things like that just in case things go bad and we go and we fill fill a shopping basket. It's just these little hand carried baskets that we use. Right. And we fill one and she's like, okay, let's go. And I was like, what are you talking about? And she's like, well, we bought twice as much as we normally do. So I was like, no, no, no. Now let's fill another one. <laughs> you know, that's only two days, right? If you shop every day. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Well, and of course, some of these things will last longer, foods. but yeah, for sure. Yeah. And we're also, also like the vegetables that we're buying now, we're buying more root vegetables because they keep longer. You know, we're not buying greens that are going to, we still do buy greens, for salads and things but um you know we're you know we've got we've got potatoes and we've got onions and we've got these kinds of things that don't go bad quite as quickly and then we've started freezing meats as well just to so that we will have some protein if we need it we normally just buy the meat we need for that day and, and cook it so yeah it's, it's been a change here as well um and i can imagine you know and also a lot of people are probably learning how to cook now <laughs> for sure right. I, mean, I, I love to cook but I, I don't like buying canned goods but I'm, I'm buying well, two reasons. One is I want to make sure to have. So if you want to supply, you have can. And then a lot of the things weren't available. There was a while. There's just no meat available. And then mm-hmm. you two packages of meat or fish. I thought, you know, that's it. So I would buy big cuts that I normally wouldn't buy because that way I know that's going to be around for a few days and just change the patterns. And, you know, right. very strange. Interesting. Yeah. A couple of ideas I, I shared with um some friends of mine who are their habitual, you know, eating out type people uh, was, you know, if you should learn to cook, get some simple cookbooks. And then the other thing you might want to start to learn how to do is pickling. Cause that's a way that you can 
preserved vegetables, you know where this, their provenance, right? You know how they, you know, they were fresh when you got them. And now you've pickled them and then you've got those pickles for, you know, for months if you need them, right? If things aren't going to get so bad, I don't think that we're, you know, you know, in, in danger of starving. But I think learning how to pickle is actually a really useful use of your free time. What else do you uh, have to do, right? <laughs> that's right. There's, a, there's an excellent book called uh, The Art of Fermentation uh, by a guy named Sander Katz which I highly recommend anybody who wants to get into pickling. It's got all kinds of recipes and explanations of the microbiology that's going on and all that kind of thing. So it's pretty the art of fermentation, huh? Uh, that's right. You learn how to make a still there as well. I, I don't, he touches on distilled alcohols, but uh, he's not a, it's not, a, not it's a not a booze guy. making book. No, no. <laughs> that's amazing. So uh, you, you have so many interesting things that we can talk about. So I do want to shift this to, to the other things, but is there anything else, you know, you want to touch on around uh, the virus and something you want to take a want, yeah? quick look again at my, at the articles, see if there's anything I feel like we need to hit on. Uh, where was that? Here it is. So I guess just to summarize, you know, that discussion of coronavirus was, you know, it's, it really comes down to social distancing and sanitation. You know, if you, can do those two things and change your habits, then, then that's gonna be very helpful. The other thing that I think people don't really think about is their immune system, right? And, you know, I'm, I'm not a fan of supplements. I don't think that there's any magic pill for your, to boost your immune system, but we do know that your immune health is, is based on diet, uh, sleep, and stress, right? So those, those three things all make a big difference. So if you can reduce your stress levels, and one way to do that in this, environment is don't spend all day reading about coronavirus. <laughs> Give yourself 30 or 45 minutes or an hour a day to read about it and then spend the rest of your day doing other things that take your mind off of it, right? Because it's not going to change. It's going to be there when you're back or when you, when you come back to it. You don't need to constantly be refreshing your browser on uh, world meters to figure out how many cases there are now. Yeah. And, that's, and then the other thing is, um, you know, get enough sleep. It's, you know, you're, your body really does need that sleep and um and then eat healthy you know healthy foods you know it's difficult in this time because you don't want to shop too much but you know as michael poland says shop shop the perimeter of the grocery store right the fresh meats and dairy the fresh fruits and vegetables you know we do need some of those processed foods just in case we need food at some point but really as much as you can eat, eat fresh and that and that's much healthier and better for your immune system because you're getting all of those nutrients naturally um and then the other thing is you know and we're about to shift gears into alcohol but you know from an immune system perspective don't drink too much um because alcohol can can harm your immune system it can suppress your immunity uh, or your immune, your immune response and then you know if you're a smoker try to cut back this might be a great time to try to quit. I know that it might be a stress reliever for you, but you know, you're doing damage to your lungs and this, this disease is worse when it, it's, when it gets to the lungs. So if your lungs aren't strong, you know, you're putting yourself at higher risk of more severe symptoms if you do catch it. So, um, the other, the other thing I hear those are just, people saying is also drink, drink more water. Mm -hmm. Helps with the yeah, hydration. Yeah. Hydration absolutely matters. That's right. Yeah. And yeah, no, that's, that's great advice as well. So, and then, you know, we did talk about panic shopping, you know, and just the, the thing to, to kind of realize is we're all in this together, right? Don't hoard things. Everybody needs it. So buy what you need. Don't buy 500 pairs of gloves. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm happy to send gloves to anybody who needs them, by the way, but <laughs> maybe I shouldn't say that because a bunch of your listeners will be reaching out. Yeah, so um, let's get them from Japan. We've got a great source. Um, that's it. No, no, but yeah, I think you've, you, uh, it's hard sometimes to remember that what you're, when there's shortages, what you're taking, someone else isn't going to be able to have. Um, mm -hmm. But the way I like to look at it is there, look at what you're hoarding. If you really need to hoard this, what's life going to, like, if you're living in an urban environment like New York City, like Manhattan, if there's no water, what is Manhattan going to be like? I mean, you know, the, the total breakdown of society, uh, water will be the least of your problems. You want to have enough water for, let's say, three days if, you know, there's a localized problem. 
Like here, mm -hmm. we, we keep enough water in case there's an earthquake and there's, you know, there's that kind of a problem. But if you're thinking, you can't, you can't hoard enough toilet paper. To, to, well, water is probably a better example. You can't, mm -hmm. most places, you don't, how are you going to store a month's worth of water? which is really what right. you're, you're talking about. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, yeah. And I don't think we're near to the point where we're looking at um, utility disruption. We're not anywhere near that point. And I don't, I'm not an engineer, but my assumption is that water is one of the easiest things to keep flowing uh, as opposed to internet or electricity, things like that. Right. Um, but we're, we're so far away from that. And I, I think we'd have national guard out and helping well before we even reach the point where that so i don't think you need to hoard those kinds of things either but i, I do think learning ways to be self-sufficient like cooking like pickling you know that sort of thing can sort of make you a little less reliant on prepared foods and that kind of thing we we did a show i haven't, haven't released it yet but uh releasing soon with uh um, a horticulturalist that uh talks about home gardening and one of the things that he's doing, he's got a project to encourage uh, kids to to garden and families to garden. And it just, uh, and when we were talking is, what are, what are some of the changes in society? I think uh, people are gonna be more interested. The ones that have a spot for garden, that's gonna be more mm -hmm. interesting to, wouldn't it be great if you've got a garden and, and, and you can get some of your vegetables in your own garden, or you save mm -hmm. some of those for when you really need it and you're short on something. Um, mm -hmm. So those are the kind of things I, I see changing in our society as well. So, yeah. 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 I mean, if you have if you have the space and your your municipality allows it, put up a chicken coop. You got eggs every day. Ah, well. You know? What's funny is um, so I'm I'm a big hockey fan, and uh, hockey players, the big hockey players, are not uh, so they're not playing. So they're they're doing these Zoom conferences where they're talking with one another and. Um, for those of those in the audience that know uh, the Anaheim Ducks and, and Ryan Getzlaf, uh, he's a prominent player. So they had a, a conference call and he's like, oh, yeah, what were you doing your time? Well, um, we had run out of eggs, so I built a chicken coop. And uh, he came out with, a, you know, with his phone and he started showing the, the chicken coop. His, no, no uh, yeah, so he, he ordered some chickens and they're, they're making their, their own eggs. It's hilarious. Uh, yeah, yeah, but it's it's a great source of protein, and it's essential. I mean, you have to feed them, so you need the you need the the meal or whatever it is that chickens eat. But you know, you get you get eggs, and you get your protein. And you don't need to you know be limited to two packs of of meat and fish in the in the grocery store. Yeah. Um, you might get tired of eggs. But <laughs> so. Um... I think let's let's change gears. You're a, you're a man of many talents, and you wear a lot of hats. So uh, let's maybe switch and talk a little bit about one of your uh, business hats. Um, your sure. so you, you, part of the reason you're in Japan is around uh, Japanese spirits. So can you tell us a little bit about that? That's right. So uh, I've been a big fan of this obscure Japanese spirit called shochu. And uh, it's its older cousin, Awamori, from Okinawa uh, for a long time. I started the first, well, not the first, but it's the largest international er, English language uh, blog about these drinks. It's a kampai.us, although there's, there hasn't been any uh, new content in a while because we've had a very slow rebuild of the website because it's not mobile friendly right now. But it will be uh, coming out soon and we'll add a bunch of new content. But uh, so that's that's how I got into it. and then. I started to get invited to speak about it, which is why I talked to the Japan Society last month in New York. There are YouTube videos of my talks. And then I got involved with the Japanese government to help with them with promotion. So I guess you could call me a category ambassador. I'm not a brand ambassador for any specific uh, distillery or specific brand, uh, but I do a lot of uh, public speaking and advocacy for shochu and awamori, which to me are just wonderful traditional distilled spirits that most people in the West don't know about. And I ended up writing a book that was published last year uh, by Tuttle called The Complete Guide to Japanese Drinks, which covers these spirits, but also Japanese whiskey, wine, beer, sake, uh, plum wine. And then also there's a chapter on Japanese cocktails. And uh, it's available from Amazon or your local bookseller. Uh, I was prepared. 
a complete guide to Japanese drinks. Uh, lots of photography uh, that I did myself. Um, and like I said, a man things. of many talents. That's, the, that's right. It's, it was a really, really fun project. And then coincidental to that, I have uh, become a partner in an import-export company here in Japan for alcohol. So we import New York State uh, craft alcohols from the Finger Lakes region, wine, cider, beer, uh, whiskey, uh, vodka, gin, and I guess that's about it. And then we uh, export uh, Japanese alcohols overseas. And so that's been a, a fun little project as well. You're making me really sad that this, that this uh, show is virtual right now because uh, <laughs> love to taste some of those things. It sounds amazing. So how did you get into it? Really, um, my interest was as a, I guess I was more of a foodie. I really got into alcohol through food where once I discovered how beautifully wine could pair with food, I really got into that. And that's what something I really lived when, or sorry, learned when I was living in New York, uh, you know, going to a nice French restaurant and having some nice French wine, Italian restaurant, Italian wine. Um, just learning about that. It was just, I've, it was always just a hobby. It was just something I enjoyed, you know, dining out with some nice drinks. And then, I, you know, you can do the same thing with craft beer. But what I found is, you know, between beer and wine, if you have too much of it with your meal, you just get full, right? Because it's a lot of calories. It's heavy. They're fermented beverages. They're not distilled. So they have a lot of residual calories, a lot of calories and a lot of residual sugars. And that's part of why they pair well, but it's also why, you know, they're heavier. And so, and I was a fan of distilled spirits. I really like whiskey. I really like rum. And my sort of, I remember saying to myself several times, it would be great to find a spirit that paired with food. But, you know, whiskey and rum are just too strong and their alcohol percentages to pair with food. You know, and you'll see like whiskey pairing meals and things like that. And I think that's kind of nonsense. Um, whiskey is just going to burn out your taste buds. If you're drinking it where you can actually taste the whiskey, you're not diluting it too much. But then I discovered shochu in an izakaya, which is a Japanese gastropub basically in New York. And shochu is typically sold between 20 and 25% alcohol. And you would think that it wouldn't have a lot of flavor because of that, but actually it's, it's single distilled in a pot still, which means a lot of the character of the, of the base ingredient comes through. And shochu is more about how it's made than what it's made from. So it's a um, very flavorful drink and extremely diverse because there's about, there are over 50 approved ingredients for what you can make it out of. And the predominant style is sweet potato in which you can actually taste the sweet potato. But when I say sweet potato as an ingredient, there are about 50 different sweet potatoes that can be used to make shochu. And each of those has their own character as far as flavor and aroma. And then there are all these other decisions that are made during the fermentation and distillation process and then aging that you can also change the character. So I did the math once and it was a, a simple calculation. And I think there are about 9 million potential variants for a flavor and, and aroma profile for shochu. And that was the simplified formula because of all of these different decisions. And, um, so it's, it's very, very broad category. I kind of call it like the craft beer of spirits because it's just so diverse. Um, and so I fell in love with that and it pairs amazingly well with food because it's lower alcohol and you have all these different flavors and aromas that you can play with. So, so that's how I got into it. You give us an example of what you would pair, like maybe a meal you've had in the past week. What, what spirit you, you paired with what food? Okay. So, um, especially like roasted meats or grilled meats uh, go quite well with sweet potato shochu, uh, which tends to be the most flavorful and aromatic of the styles. Uh, and then lighter vegetable dishes and, and, and fish tend to go with uh, rice shochu. And then I find, uh, so like barbecue, like American style barbecue or that sort of, you know, smoked meat sort of thing goes quite well with what's known as kokuto shochu, which is quite like a rum. It's, uh, it's made from uh, dried sugar cane uh, juice. It's, it's, a, it's hard to explain. Kokuto is it's a dried molasses, essentially, sugar based on sugar cane. And it, 
it's unrefined, completely unrefined. So the, the direct translation would be black sugar. So when we think of brown sugar, it's the stuff that you bake with, but this is like, this is dark. It looks like dark chocolate. Um, and it is so flavorful and really, really deep in its, in its character. And it makes for a lovely shochu. Uh, so, so, they, so are these, why, let, let's say in, in, in my local liquor store, would I find that? If they have shochu, you, you probably can find these styles, but you might just have one brand. But there are about 5,000 brands in Japan. Wow. And there are about 100 of those come to the United States. Because, you know, if, if, you'd have, if you'd have told me when, when we were talking about having you on the show, if one of the results was that I'm, I'm going to buy one of these uh, spirits and try mm -hmm. it out, uh, would not have, you know, like, would not have thought we'd be talking about this, but you, you make it sound like I, I want to do this. I think uh, I do like to grill fish and I like to grill meats. And uh, this sounds amazing. I, if I can get it while we're, we're quarantined, that's, that's one thing I'd like sure. to experiment with. That's well, liquor stores are vital services, right? They so, are actually. I and mean, there's, yeah. there's some articles you see about them. Like there were some people who were like, uh, we should really close those down. I'm like, no, right now that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's not a good idea. Right. Yeah. Well, it, it, it's interesting. I was talking to uh, somebody I know that's in the alcohol distribution business in New York. And they said that liquor stores right now are just killing it. Yeah. They're making so much more money than they were before. Um, because everyone's shifted to drinking at home, right? You're not drinking out anymore. So it's a nice little boon for those businesses, you know, when a lot of other businesses are struggling. Well, and it costs we know less. liquor stores are going to be around. That's right. If you go out and you drink, you know, the amount you're drinking, you can drink a lot more. It's not necessarily mm -hmm. a better thing or a better quality right. or what have you. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, the thing that's interesting is like I, as I told you earlier, I don't drink that often. I think I've, I've, I've one evening was drinking since this all started. But the one time that I did is uh, a bunch of my friends and I got together on a Zoom call and we, you know, we, we each pulled out some, you know, I, I took out some Johnny Walker black and uh, nice. various, you know, people took whatever they took out and, you know, we just talked and, and drank and uh, nobody had to worry about yep. a designated driver. Right. But, that's right. Yeah, we've been doing that as well. Uh, in Japanese, they, this is something that Japanese people have been doing for a while, even before all of this self-quarantine and whatever. And it, in Japanese, it's called on nomi. And on so it's nomi. online. On huh. is online. They shorten yeah. online to on. And then nomi is, uh, means drink. And then so no, nomi kai is a drinking party. So nomi drink kai party, right? So they just make it on nomi is the, on is nomi. the short name. On nomi. So that's uh that's been quite fun and we will do the same thing we'll get a bunch of people on a zoom call and we'll all crack open whatever we like and uh it's it's a nice way of socializing with with maintaining distance oh for sure yeah i have so, a question for you actually in in california what do you, do you sell liquor in grocery stores yeah. or is it a separate well there are liquor spirits stores. as well yep but it, but in your grocery store can you buy spirits i guess is the yeah. question yeah Okay. And my Vons, yeah, you know, the, the Johnny Walker Black, I bought at Vons. Okay. Yeah. So then at probably your Asian supermarkets, if you have any of those nearby, will probably have shochu. Uh, one of the predominant brands is Ichiko. It's the largest, the best selling in, in, the, in the States. It's a, a barley shochu. And I actually call it the Johnny Walker shochu oh, because yeah. they, they specialize in blending. Uh, now, it's not barrel aged, so it won't look like um you know it's not going to be golden like a like a whiskey but it's it, they do blend a different a number of different styles of barley shochu to come up with the flavor profile that they have that's interesting. Uh, so that's that's a brand that you might be able to find relatively easily that may even be available like if you go to usually they're misplaced in in regular supermarkets or liquor stores they'll be with the sake they'll be sort of mixed in because the owners usually don't know the difference i wouldn't have um, done. yeah but yeah, that, that's probably the brand you're most likely to find easily in California. It's yeah. almost ubiquitous in Hawaii, actually. You'll just go into bars in Hawaii and there's, there's Ichiko on the shelf because there's so many Japanese tourists who go to Hawaii. My, my Asian friends are telling me that that's, they, now's the time to shop in Asian shops because everyone there wears masks and they've got the hygiene and the distancing anyway. So That's not uh, a bad suggestion, actually. Yeah. Yeah, of course, everyone does want, they'll do better money-wise, but uh, have mm -hmm. the same problem. But, I, you know, 
fruits and vegetables you can buy you can buy there as well right so that's right I'm thinking where the, the there must be some closer i'll, I'll check that out that's yeah very cool. I, I don't know the i don't know the geography of la very well but i know torrance has a large japanese community i don't know if that's far from you or not but no not far um okay yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I'm, just I'm sure you can find shochu there. Oh, for sure. So I'll, I'll definitely check that out. Um, uh, we, we have been going long, but I uh, just enjoying this conversation. I could go another hour with you easily. I, I think <laughs> it's, there's so much we could talk about. And in your background, we have we barely scratched the surface. So we'll have to have you back for another oh, conversation. It'll be a lot of fun. But be, be, before we wrap up, one uh, one thing that I'm really interested in, given how many different interests i mean you you teach you um you've got the you know the the interests around the spirits and uh, and you 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 do some you do consulting so as we talked earlier you just have a very full day um are there any habits that you have like my my context around it is what can you do to win the day uh, if you if you're trying to lose weight you you win today you win tomorrow you put two weeks in a row then you're going to start to lose weight. You're not going to lose 50 pounds in a day. You got to lose it, you know, kind of half a pound at a time. If you're trying to build a business, you're you're not going to get a million dollar account on your first day. You've got to, you know, get things together. And so you're juggling so many different things and you're obviously a high achiever in, in quite a number of them. What is it that you do that has you, oh, first of all, you know, do you do it a little bit at a time or maybe you've got a different methodology? Like what, what do you do to be successful? You know, I've, I've read a lot about this and a lot of people say that multitasking is not an efficient way of working, but I'm a multitasker. I, I juggle lots of things and I, things absolutely fall through the cracks. There's times when I miss deadlines or things completely slip my mind, <laughs> you know, and you know, part of it is I, you know, and if, if you or your listeners have any recommendations for sort of task management solutions, you know, that would be great. Uh, maybe Joe knows something. Your well, brother. yeah, um, he does. But, he actually recommended what I use, which is an app called Things. Okay. And uh, well, so the thing is, a lot of them are adapted from the, there's, there's a book which became a movement. I can't remember the author, but the name of the book is Getting Things Done. Mm. And so Things is kind of like around that. There are, others, okay. there, there are other methodologies that have apps that work around them. Um, mm -hmm. There's, there's uh, one called Monday, which is kind of a pseudo- project management one. There's another one called Trello, which has more of a bulletin board uh, metaphor. Okay. But yeah, there's, there's a lot of them. But for, okay. personally, I yeah. recommend things. Anyway. Yeah. I, but the way that I tend to, well, another, another thing that I've been, that I've, I'm a strong believer of is uh, I was once told that what takes you two weeks in your 20s, takes you two days in your 30s, takes you two hours in your 40s as you become an expert at something, it takes you a lot less time to do that thing. You know, we become more efficient. And so I could not possibly handle all of the tasks that I can do in a single day now when I was younger. I just didn't have the expertise. I didn't have the skills. I also didn't have the discipline. You know, I, I, something that I feel very, very fortunate for is I don't feel like I'm working. Nothing that I do feels like work. I enjoy it. Um, from from my scientific research to my teaching to my, you know, booze business, all of this is fun to me, and and that's a joy, you know. So I don't mind putting in long hours and working on weekends and that sort of thing, because um, it's fun. And you know, there's, you know, I think a lot of people in my scientific life are like, why are you so interested in alcohol? Isn't that unhealthy? And you know, an epidemiologist promoting Japanese alcohol doesn't seem to fit, but there is the quality of life aspect of it, right? We, humans have been drinking alcohol for a long time for a lot of reasons. And of course, there are risks of addiction and there are health consequences to frequent or excessive alcohol consumption. But um, these are beautiful craft products, you know, with centuries of tradition that most people don't know about. And that's really, really fun to to explain to people and alcohol does make it make us feel good that's why it's an essential service right now <laughs> you know so um yeah so i really i it took me a while to reconcile that you know for a long time people were like so 
if you're such an advocate for shochu, are you ever just going to get into the business? And I was like, no, I don't really, I don't feel good about that, you know, uh, philosophically. But I've come to realize actually this is another way that I can, you know, hopefully help people in this crazy world that we live in. So um, I don't want to give up my research. I don't want to give up my teaching and I don't want to give up my, you know, my booze work. So I have to juggle all of them. Um, and I'm not, I'm not that good with, like, I don't sit and, and schedule everything out, but I'll work on a task. One thing I'm very good at actually is staying focused. So once I have a task in front of me, I will get it done with, you know, as long as it takes, unless I do have to set it aside, you know, to work on something else, but I, I'm, I'm good at finishing things. And that I think is a big deal, right? I have artistic friends who are just incredibly creative, but they never actually finish a project. It feels that way, right? Um, where maybe, I don't know if it's a scientist in me or what, but like I need to complete my experiment. I need to, you know, finish this project. Got to check that box. And so that's, I guess, part of what motivates me. Um, that's really and, valuable advice. I, I think, you know, in having so many conversations that I'm having, what I find is that some sometimes people are going to, really you know what you say might speak to one person another person like i can't multitask i'm just completely ineffective mm -hmm. when i multitask and mm -hmm. i think the generalizations come from if you're that type of person you make generalizations assume everyone's like you so maybe mm -hmm. not everyone's like you but the people that can multitask uh, maybe the key thing for them is finish stuff you're multitasking don't multitask mm -hmm. and leave things incomplete maybe that's right. the lesson that's mm -hmm. at least what i'm hearing from you so you finish stuff that's that's rare actually yeah, that's, I guess so. I don't know. It's how I operate, but I, I do think I could be more efficient and more effective if I had a, a technological solution that works for me. I've tried a bunch of these different apps and things like that, and none of them seem to be sticky for me. You know, I have a sauna, I'll put a whole bunch of tasks in there and then I won't look at it for a month, you know? So, and I really, I'm hoping to find some sort of solution that helps me better manage this without actually going to the expense of hiring a personal assistant. <laughs> Yeah, well, that makes sense. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I wonder, just listening to you, you seem like a Trello kind of person. Uh, spend spend an hour, look to see if Trello works for you. But, okay, I'll have a look at that for sure. Yeah, but who knows? Um, the the thing that's interesting though is um, the inc like you you're not asserting oh this will work, but so something you're doing is working, obviously, right? So um, uh, that's why I find it so interesting because. Uh, you, you, you didn't get to be, you know, a doctor by not finishing your work and maybe you, you'd be multitasking. It's not, you know, yeah, I'm, I was, I figured I was in med school anyway. I may as well finish it. It, it probably took something to do that. Right. And yeah, and well, I actually, I actually didn't go to medical school. I have a PhD in epidemiology. And okay. even today, when people ask me, what's the hardest thing you've ever done? The hardest thing I've ever done is finishing that PhD. The, that my dissertation was such a grind because I was, you know, probably like most high school and college kids, I was lazy. You know, I, I was not self-motivated. I was driven by deadlines that my professors gave me. I'd write my term papers the night before they were due and I would study, I'd cram for tests and all that sort of thing. But when I got into a PhD program, there was nobody pushing me. I could have stayed in that program until they kicked me out because I hadn't finished. Wow. But I realized that I needed to finish, right? I couldn't actually start the career that I wanted until I got that degree. And so I ended up basically teaching myself how to finish projects. And I finished my PhD at the time was, I was the fastest to finish the PhD program in epidemiology at UAB. Wow. And I did it in, I think this is after I had my master's degree already, but I finished the PhD itself in two years and nine months which there was one other student who had done that, but she already had a doctor. She already had a, an MD. Right. So for her, it was a little bit easier to know what she needed to do to finish. Um, and I think I, I just started to apply that to my work. Right. I am, I, I am now self-motivated. I would much rather do my work and then watch Netflix and have a, a glass of shochu at the end of the day, rather than take a break and, and watch a, you know, a, an episode of a, of a series that I'm into during the day. Um, I treat myself at the end of the day, right. With a good meal, a nice drink and some, you know, some entertainment, but, um, I'll, I'll keep, keep working 
you know, sometimes even after dinner, I'll work till, till midnight. So it's Makes just, sense. but it's, I enjoy it, right? It's, it's not a slog. There's, there's nothing that I do that I try to avoid. Like if it's something that I, I've realized, and this is another thing, is if there's some responsibility that I have that I want to avoid, that I don't want to do, I either find somebody else to do it or I quit, right? I'm either, I'm either delegating or it shouldn't be on my port and my plate. It should, it should, you should either be, be finishing it, delegating it or deleting it. That's right. That's right. Oh, that's very good. I'm going to steal that. Yeah. Oh, no, please do. No. That's awesome. <laughs> uh, oh, so one, one quick side point. So, so what's the distinction between which disciplines are in med school and not? Is it whether you're treating patients or directly or? Yeah, physician, being trained as a physician, as a clinician in medical school. And then for any of the sciences in which you're doing the research, uh, then that would be typically in a PhD program. You don't so learn how to run lab, like run laboratory assays and things like that in medical school. Got you. For some reason, I thought that some, some people go to med school and they do laboratory work. I'd, I'd known they, you years. can, you can. Yeah. And that's what, that's often what happens. I mean, you learn so much in medical school, you've got such a, a wealth of knowledge on the human body and biology and chemistry that you can very easily transition that into a research career without going and getting a PhD. Gotcha. Um, I never had, I never had an interest in, in being a clinician. That's way too much responsibility to have people's lives in my hand. And I have so much respect for, for physicians and but I did, I never wanted that level of responsibility. You know, I would rather do research that can help people that could contribute to society without a life on the line, you know, based on my decisions. That just, I don't think I'm built for that. I think right. I'm built for something else. Well, that's, good. I mean, that's another key is knowing yourself, right? If you know that that isn't going to work for you, then don't do that. Right. That's right. That's amazing. So, uh, wow. Thank you for, for taking the time and, and, uh, and going through all these topics. Uh, before we go, is there something you want to leave the audience with? I mean, I, I just think I'd like to step back to coronavirus for a moment if we can. And I, you, sh you should not be living in fear. This is, a, this is a virus like any other virus. It's not a super bug. This is not an incurable you know, planet threatening epidemic. It's, it's a very serious epidemic. It's the biggest one we've faced in a long time. But this virus is a wimp. You can kill it with soap and water. You can kill it with an alcohol solution. So just use those precautions we discussed at the beginning of the show. Wash your hands, social distance, you know, be smart about it. And uh, we're going to get through this. And, you know, and we are, we're stronger together, you know, lean on your friends and family, those people that can help support you emotionally, you know, talk to them more. I'm doing video conferences with friends and family so much more often than I did before this started. Cause we, we all need that emotional support and, you know, there's lots of ways to find that, but we're going to be okay. We're going to get through this, but we all need to work together, right? This is a team effort. Societies need to come together and do these things in unison in order to get things done. You know, and that in entrepreneurial America, where its individual liberties are so important, that that can be a challenge, right? In Japan, they're very conformist. You tell Japanese people to do something, or they're going to do it. You tell Korean people to do something, they're going to do it. You have these cultures here in Asia that are based very much on on the community is larger than the individual, and America has a different mindset for better or for worse. I mean, America is incredibly innovative, incredibly successful. But American culture as it's currently designed is not necessarily equipped for community response to an epidemic. And so I would just say, you know, let's, let's be more Japanese. Let's try to try to get through this and, you know, we'll have a different society and, you know, when we come out on the other end, but it's still going to be, you know, hopefully better, you know, so Let's make it better. I think that's a, that was a long, long no, closing excellent. words, but yeah. Thank you Thank so you. much. It was my pleasure. I really enjoyed this and I'd be happy to come on again when we can talk about something other than pandemic disease. Oh, we'll definitely have to have you on. Thank you so much. Great. Yeah. Thank you. All right.